Today on Lightning Bugs. The new idea is always better than the old idea because the old idea, you're halfway through it and it's suddenly no longer this thing of, that's what I'm going to do. It's like you're 40,000 words in, you're, you're halfway through it, and all sorts of problems have been thrown up that you haven't thought about. When it's you not started. romantic anymore. Yeah, the truth is that finishing something is always a grind um, and, right. and, and doing something for the 10th time or you know, re relaying the drum track or whatever it is that you guys have to do. Yeah. Um, where it, it, yeah, the spark of the original creativity is gone, really. Yeah. And, and you're down to the work of it. But it's, it's that detail that pays off. Hi, thank you for watching my podcast. If you've been enjoying the podcast, let us know how we're doing. Go to Lightning Bugs on Apple Podcasts and leave us a review with your thoughts. Or if you have any ideas for guests, we want to hear from you, so leave us that. Leave us your suggestions on Apple Podcast Reviews. Here's, here's, my, here's my intro, which I'm going to make Nick sit through. Uh, most of it comes from Wikipedia anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Nick Hornby has written books, more books, essays, and movies than one might shake a stick at. Seven best-selling novels, including High Fidelity, About a Boy, A Long Way Down, but fuck, who's counting? Oscar nominations for An Education in Brooklyn, his 10-part short-form TV series, State of the Union, directed by Stephen Frears, has been, been broadcast by Sundance Channel and BBC, and has won three Emmys. But who's counting? He lives in London. That doesn't matter. Uh, that's just in Wikipedia. Newly published novel, Just Like You. Uh, September 29, 2020, set in the months leading up to the Brexit referendum in 2016, Lucy, a white 42-year-old single mother of two, unexpectedly finds love with Joseph, a black 22-year-old man of multiple part-time jobs. Just Like You follows the ups and downs of what an interracial relationship with a large age gap is like in a country getting more divided by the week. Now, you don't have to read it now. You've, you've heard the basics yeah, of that. thank you. Yeah. Uh, this is the part that hurts in, in Wikipedia. It says, uh, Hornby broke a long winning streak by writing 11 songs with Ben Folds for the <laughs> album Lonely Avenue. <laughs> it actually doesn't say that. Okay, so that's my intro, Nick. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the author of the only books I've actually read front to back. I I'm kidding. Uh, my friend, Nick Hornby. Yeah, I know you haven't read them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's good to see you. It's very nice to see you, Ben. You know, I have questions for you. Sometimes I, I still don't know how to do a podcast. Sometimes I, I uh, just start talking. Other times it's more formal. I, okay. I, I felt like I just want to ask you questions. Um and so I'm just going to do it that way because we've never spoken in that way. So I no. have like formal questions. Here's the first formal question. Yeah. When we were doing interviews together and someone was interviewing us, a couple of times you said this, and it really stuck with me. All art constantly aspires towards the condition of music. Um, only recently did I realize that you were quoting Walter Pater. Yeah. Okay, so um, the rest of the quote then goes like this. For while in all other kinds of art, it is possible to distinguish the matter from the form, and the understanding can always make this distinction. I'm not sure if I've gotten this right. Uh, <laughs> let me start again. Obviously, I can't read aloud. That's why We're I getting never, somewhere. That's why I never quote the rest of it. Well, let's just get into it. If uh, Forget that. Let's start with just your, your quote. All art constantly aspires towards a condition of music. I always thought that the, the condition of music always aspired to all the other art forms, that, that I was just trying to tell a story and do it with something very abstract and that it never quite got there. So I, 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 I explain your, your take on that. Well, um, for me, uh, everything I do is about the expression of some kind of feeling but because it's a book, it has to take the form of words and be about something. Mm. Um, but if I could, I'd ditch the words and just focus on the chord changes. Uh, but, uh, right. but I haven't got that. 
So, I mean, of course, I try, I try and make the books about something, but it's a musical impulse and it, and it's a musical effect that I want to achieve. I, I think a lot of writers feel that way, that the words kind of get in the way. Somehow. Yeah. I mean, there's a neurological uh, explanation maybe for that and that the, uh, and I've said this a few times on this podcast, but I think it's, it, it's pretty incredible that th- there's two places in your brain that, that, that form words and, and then express them. And they're both as small as a, as a walnut. The rest of the brain will light up and, in a brain scan to music. So music is implanted on all sound is implanted on all parts of uh, of the brain. So it might just be that words are just more difficult for us to, uh, uh, to, to, to work with in general. But to me, that makes it a greater art form. Like I still look up to, way up to books. I think the music on the pecking order must be like, you know, right above like whatever crustaceans do. And then you're like up here. I like your um, stutter during... Uh, so when while you were saying that words are harder than other things, you had a few uh, uh's and some. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, well, I, I I can only suppose that anyone who works in an art form always envies what someone else does. I think that might be true. I mean, that was part of my notes on this. Is just um, you know, uh, is the grass always greener on the other side of the artistic fence? I mean, I tried to write a book. Um, and, uh, oh, well, thank you. Uh, I, I, I was a tourist. I, I, I did one. <laughs> I don't know how you've done so many. If, if, if you're, if it's emotional, is that, does that mean that's where the first impulse comes from you? Like before writing the book, what's, what, what are you aware of before you actually decide I'm going to spend my time writing a book? No, it always starts off, as it were, in literary form, by which I mean um, over a period of maybe a year or two, I, I've got a character and then a fragment of story. And quite often the fragment of story, then I uh, I work out that it belongs to another fragment of story that I had a few years ago and didn't know right. what to do with. I find with music and words, it's actually like that. If I have a feeling and I can't, I can't explain it, but there's a tone and it's taking over this time period. Later on, I'll remember that tone. It was yeah, just yeah. another time period, you know. The well, music that I'm thinking randomly in that time period, something of it just absolutely just collides and connects. They're the same thing. Right. I always remember when we were working together, before we wrote the album, that you sent me a tune and said, write lyrics for this. And the tune was devastatingly good. I mean, it was fantastic. And I, I took great pains to write words that fit. And I said yeah. to you, and you said, no, that's not it. <laughs> mm, no, no. <laughs> no, no, but what I realized is that somewhere you knew what the song was, yeah. even though it was only melody. Yeah, uh, and I could have written five thousand lyrics, and I that's think right. you would have sent them all back and said that's not it. I, but, I, I'm incredibly close-minded. Once the music yeah. occurs to me, yeah. even though I don't know what it is, I just know what it isn't, and that's a exactly. terrible way to write. Yeah, that was really interesting to me. And and when I was sending you lyrics, then you, you were just coming back with tunes, and um, and it, that seemed a very straightforward process. Yeah, part. and it wasn't really fair because there were two of them that I remember you didn't completely agree with, and I just kept going. <laughs> but <laughs> but I guess that's just because I have to deliver it on an album. Uh, yeah, exactly. And, and, and that's that just the real. Yeah. I have thought to go back uh, to that. What we're talking about is the song Claire's Ninth, I believe. Yes. And yeah, I that's had. Right. You remember. And it was that I wrote the words for. And you had this incredible melody, which I don't think has resurfaced anywhere. No, it hasn't. I I kept playing with it. Have you still? I never it? found it. I still have it. I still know it. And I, it has occurred to me before. Why don't I just go and record the words that you had sent to me with that, and and why not? And see if I was dead wrong. Maybe I was just being way too close minded about it. I have a way of thinking about words and music where they're actually 
they have to be at tension or at ease with each other right. in, 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 in something. And, and I, I, sometimes it's just like it needs to be a passive verb there. That's all I know. I don't even know what it's about, you know. Well, I, I would a, like you to do that and just send me an MP3 file and then we're done with it. No one else has to hear it. But I, want, I so want to hear that, that tune again. I'd like yeah. to put my words on it even. The final, um, the final version of that is a bastardization of that tune where I used a little bit of its DNA, but I just yeah. didn't completely yeah. go there. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, another thing, when you were saying that about the two different ideas that come together at one time, it reminds me of, um, uh, I talked to the composer, uh, Russian-Australian composer, Elena katz Chernin, and she didn't understand how to make theme and variations until an older composer told her that in order for it to work, she has to invent a completely new motif as well. So she just can't vary the themes. She actually has to bring in something original, and that gives it the spark of having two ideas uh, working okay. against yeah. each other. That's true. And that yeah. solves her problems. Yeah, something about the two, uh, yeah, the yeah. two things uh, having two things collide and work together. Well, I, I mean, don't know what it is, but it. It's the thing that sets me off. It's like, okay, there's the other thing, and then things start to accumulate. That's the other thing is that I sit with these things, and, you know, I, I, I've got one at the moment. Um, I've got a character, um, and it needs a form, um, and I've got an idea for a form, but most of the things that I consume, or many of the things that I consume from this point on, whether it will be music, or, or books or, or movies, that little bits of uh, fluff will come off and start to stick um, yes. and, yeah. and, and grow, and there will eventually come a time, not yet, when, when I think, okay, I've got enough, I want to go. And that's funny because, I mean, that's, that sounds like a lot like the way I work, which is a lot of songwriters would go, nah, I'm going to write about this. Or they have a chorus, like, you know, yeah. I don't know, just some catchy – a uh, bumper sticker of an idea. They're like, that's clever. I'm going with that. And I love those songs. I don't think I've ever, I maybe I have, but I don't recall uh, ever, ever doing that. And I, I have a, I carry a little guilt that I have no point that I'm beginning with, with, with no point And they're just working towards a point in the dark. Does it feel like that? If you start with a character and then you're trying to find form of it and someone says, why did you write this book? Then do you have an answer to that? Well, the characters that stick, um, I think, have a resonance for me that might take the book to discover. Um, but there are, you know, I quite often have character or story ideas where I think, well, that that's a perfectly reasonable idea, but it's not me, and, and I don't know where to take it, and it doesn't hmm. go anywhere. Whereas um, I think the ones that do stick, it, it's because I, they're allowing me to lay something on the top of them uh, that I'm interested in or that I've been feeling, and I can start to see that it will echo it in ways that uh, are going to be helpful to me. You're saying it's, it's giving the character, it's allowing the character the dimension that the character deserves. The character deserves, but also that I need in order to funnel whatever it is I've got going on through him or her. So if you're like, if someone, and I think it's a perfectly good question. I never mind this question. Someone says words are music first. It's easy for me to answer. And I think it's actually interesting for yeah. you character. I'm sure you get asked this character or story first. And it sounds like character. It's been both. Um, mm. uh, I can remember um, with the, the book about a boy that I was with my son in a park and I took an, at the time, unmarried friend with me um, and we were pushing uh, our son on the swing and he looked around and said, nobody ever told me there were so many babes in places like this. <laughs> and, and, uh, and it just made me laugh, the idea that a children's playground was this, you know, it was better than a nightclub for um, <laughs> And yeah. uh, so that's when... The idea of, um, you know, that got me started, that this character invents a son so that he can join a single parent, single parents group came from. 
And then things started to stick to that uh, when I was thinking about it. Do, at that point, uh, in your imagination, does do you discover the character, or do you have, did you grab a character that had sort of been in your soul wanting to erupt? No, I wanted a character who was good for that story. Um, the kid had had pre existed, um, okay, but not, uh, but not not Will, not the main character. Um, so that was a good collision of things because I'd been kicking around with this kid for a while. Yeah, kids are really important in your in your storytelling. They almost well, it makes sense that they're the innocent ones. But you really, you 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 really, there's a lot of dignity in the kids and all all the things that I've I've read that that. Yeah, you've I, well, I mean, I've you know I've had kids for a long time, but um, I tend to write domestic novels, and yeah. um, uh, and if you know, it's they what happen. Really, in, in 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 the home, um, pretty much all the books are about private lives, and you know, for a huge number of adults, that involves kids. Um, but I think they're they're interesting and funny as well. And um, uh, you know, my kids have made me laugh both inadvertently and deliberately. And you know, I, I, I'm a comic writer as well when I can, when I can get away with it. And um, and kids are a good source of that, but I I think that it's it's easy to easy to make kids memorable. Hmm. Why why is that? Quite often because they're very eccentric, and that eccentricity gets knocked out of them. I mean, that's that's really one of the things that about a boy is is about is that that mm. kid ceases to be an eccentric person and and starts to get by in life. Um, Gets in with a program. Yeah, and it's kind of sad, but you're relieved for him as well because uh, he he is going to be okay. Um, And that kid came from... When I was a teacher, I I was given this class to teach, which was... I mean, it was there were like half a dozen kids in it, and they didn't know what... It was just a class where they didn't know what to do with them. They they, they were supposed to be learning French, and none of them were regarded as capable of being learning French, okay. of being able to learn French. And there were two kid, two boys in this class. One was a, a Romani kid, a traveller, and he used to come to school for a few days, disappear for two months, come back for a few days, disappear. I mean, his education was kind of a wreck. And the other kid was this really weird nerd who'd... Um, been brought up in South Africa, was very militaristic and quite racist, Mm. a little specky kid. And one day I came into class and neither of them were there. And uh, and I said to the other kids, do you know where they've gone? So they're in the toilets, they're in the boys' toilets. So I went down to the boys' toilets (laughs) and they're both sitting in there shivering on this pipe, this Romani kid who was illiterate and this South African nerd. And uh, and I said to them, "Come on, guys, back in the classroom." And uh, and the travelling kid said, "I fucking hate the teachers at this school." And the other kid said, "I just hate this school in toto." <laughs> <laughs> and the idea that I was teaching this class for dumbos who couldn't learn French, I was teaching it to a kid who knew how to say "in toto," and yet I somehow wound up in this, in this class. I thought. I got to remember that. So in the book, I swapped the weird, unattractive South African militaristic background for a hippie, dippy mother who won't let him eat McDonald's and that kind of stuff. And that's the thing that sets him apart. Wow, that's quite a switch. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but they, like I say, they sat there for a while. That's funny. You do do you? I mean, do you like like before a certain age? Do you like? All kids, like, do you give them a free pass? Because I, I find even I'm terrible. It's some, some even babies. I'm like, I don't like that guy. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm absolutely the same. Um, and and my kids, you know, I, I, I say, oh, he's not coming round, is he? And uh, I say, Dad, <laughs> he, Dad, he he was sick on on the carpet when he was three. Let it go, you know. And I said, well, he shouldn't have been sick on the carpet. <laughs> not on my carpet. <laughs> No, it's funny when you have. 
I'd just written another series of State of the Union and, and one of the characters in there says something about his granddaughter and um, his wife says, will you just let it go? And he says, she's just not likeable, but she's two years old. And I feel that way about kids. My general feeling about kids and all people is that, like, everyone has friends. I mean, I've never met anyone who didn't have friends, even if this person was an arsehole. Right. And, um, and I think you've got to keep walking round and round the character until you see why they might have friends. I love that. Because I've heard, like, you know, writers say, you know, don't write down to a character. And every character is the most important person in the world, at least to themselves. <laughs> yeah. But but to walk around the friends, that's that's really interesting. When your characters have flaws, and they always do, yeah. um, they, I feel like you, and maybe this is wrong, but I feel like you usually give them the benefit of the doubt that they're aware of knowing that and sharing that at some point. There's some self-reflection that 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 allows someone to be either slightly self-deprecating or to say, even in our songs, like the song Belinda, yeah, the writer does a, I mean, the the the, the singer of the song does a yeah. very Nick Hornby moment in saying, yeah. "Before I made it all go wrong, he knows it's his fault." But yeah. I don't find that's true of all people <laughs> that they know that they know it's their fault. But I love that you write that way. It allows yeah. people a space. I think if you're you're asking people to give of their time. Um, over 300 pages or whatever, I, I, I think you've got to think ahead of them a little bit. So, I mean, I don't. I really hate it when readers say, oh, I just didn't like that character. He was unsympathetic. Um, mm. But I also, I also sympathise with the unsympathetic response because if they're not going anywhere, why read the book at all? I think that there's, there's right. got to be... As Seinfeld said, some learning and growing, even if it's just a millimeter. Oh, I think so. I mean, that's definitely true of a song. I feel like the third chorus, if that is not coming from a slightly different person or it feels yeah. slightly different, and it's just a song, it's just three minutes. But if it doesn't come across, even if it's just because you added timpani to it and some background singers, <laughs> so, something has to, and it's not just that it's evolved in arrangement, it yeah. actually is a different, you are now slightly different. And I've always been fascinated by your song, um, All You Can Eat, mm. because of the different perspectives. There are different perspectives in there. Yeah. Well, my father's in a lot of it because I sat across from him once, or that I can remember, like at a Denny's, and he was saying some of those things, like, you know, uh, <laughs> yeah. look, at all, look at all these look at all these fat people in here. <laughs> you know? that, that's great. And it is. It's like, you know, to be able to say that in a song uh, and then blame it on my father. Um, I, I don't know how many people are in there. Sometimes I just I just get through it. Um, and that's a song that was on an EP and and therefore no one's ever asked me about it. So I don't have a <laughs> I don't have this I don't have the press response for that. I don't yeah. remember. <laughs> I'm just seeing the chords right now. And this is a thing, actually, I'll, if I could turn it around, since uh, uh, I have questions for you, yeah. which is, I'm kind of a numbers person, and I think piano players often are. I, I'm really distracted by syllables, uh, uh, the key change, all that stuff. If something true comes through in my songs, it's almost like I was distracted enough about other things to let it out by accident. <laughs> and then it gets there. And then the and then the music can paint it some, but not very often am I all 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 that aware of it. I get really into numbers. Now when I, I wrote you about my book early on, like I'm like, yeah. I'm writing a book and I sent you an email and I was concerned about the numbers. Yeah. And I said, I'm sitting at like 140,000 words. And it took me about three paragraphs to explain this to you. I think you sent back two sentences. And one of them was, I've never written a book over 85,000. Yeah. And then I was like, oh shit. Two things. One, you got your point across in two sentences and it took me three paragraphs. <laughs> the second thing was that I knew that meant that I was way off the mark and I needed to get my numbers down. Um, how, how much do you think about these forms and numbers when you're putting together a book? At what point do you start to concern yourself 
with numbers? Well, I know I haven't got 140,000 words in me. Um, you know, words come hard <laughs> to me. So right. I know, you know, the, the, I had a friend once who wrote a million page book. Uh, and she said it, it, and it just keeps on coming. And of course, it never got published. Um, right. Number one. But secondly, I just, I just couldn't imagine where it had all come from inside, right. more or less. Yeah. You know, it's more or less automatic writing at that kind. That's of That's amazing. So you're genetically wanna, like a perfect uh, novelist uh, right. writer of books because right. it just comes out. I mean, I do have people ask me, "When do you know a song's finished?" It's fucking finished. I don't well, actually I, have a problem with that. I, I I mean, the numbers are important to me because I think, is this, first of all, is this going to get me to 80,000 words? Mm, um, right. And at 70,000 words, I think books have been published shorter than this and I can start to relax. And right. if I realize that I've still got a lot to go at 70,000 words or I've still got stuff left to do, then right. I, I really think, okay, this is going to, um, this is going to work. The first book I ever wrote, which was Fever Pitch, I was constantly terrified that the next two words would be the end and I'd have right. 23,000 words that I could do nothing with. So uh, it was really a big moment for me to get to the 80,000 words or, or whatever it was and think now, now I can relax. But you don't, you don't end up with a 140,000 word book that you find yourself cutting down. No, you actually get no. there. I always underwrite for a start, right. um, and it's when I'm reading it back and doing a second draft, it gets longer, not shorter, because yeah. I can see that I've taken jumps and, and not maybe taken the reader with me in those jumps, mm. um, and that needs filling in. So I'm, I'm probably too terse uh, with my first draft, and it becomes a little bit more expanded. I think, though, keeping in mind that my whole idea about this podcast was to allow people who make things, it's very niche. It's for people who are creative and make things just to get a little look into stuff. And I think that's actually really significant. I'm going to guess that most people uh, who write uh, long form, you know, books, novels and stuff instead of songs, probably overwrite and then pull it back. Yeah. And that's always the instruction from writing teachers is that pare it down, pare it down, which is interesting, actually, because if you go into an airport bookstore, they're big bastards, oh, all of those Big books. bastards, yeah. <laughs> and, and they're not doing the 80,000-word thing. They're doing, mm. like, the 200,000-word thing. Yeah. And, and selling shed loads. So I know. People, people do want the longer books, but I, I can't write them. I can already see the artwork on the covers of those paperbacks you're talking about. They, they're yeah. always real glittery-looking, lots yeah, of yeah. – they, 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 look, they look like uh, 80s wallpaper or something. I just finished a tiny book. Uh, a 30,000 word book. Um, Writing or reading it? <laughs> <laughs> Both. Uh, I haven't read it yet. Um, I've only written it. I'm going to take uh, this is a part of the podcast where we take a couple of questions from the peanut gallery. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to let them roll the tape on that. I'll do my best job to answer one then pass it to you. Hi there. My question is, how do you find inspiration? And then once you get inspired and have an idea, how do you know that that idea is worth exploring? I find myself getting distracted, getting super excited by one shiny new idea and then going to the next one and going to the next one. And I'm wondering if you have a process for really hunkering down and following through an idea or if it's best to follow the idea that excites you the most. I mean, shit, that's that's the the question. I mean, for me, I think maybe it's the business yeah, that's an important part of it because if if I didn't have a deadline or didn't have some kind of outside reason, my songs stay in the inspiration state. I walk around, they're in my head, I hear applause, mission accomplished, and it's done. But I kind of need I need something external and and uh and and uh and human and small. I think inspiration finds me uh rather than the other way around. But I did learn a whole lot from a Mr. Nick Hornby because when we were working together, you, I realized you make something that looks like office hours. Yeah. 
And you make yeah. sure that all day long you've got the net out and you're working your kid. For me as a musician, and especially one coming from the unfortunate era of the 90s where everything's supposed to be inspiration, like, man, I didn't feel it. Or, oh, man, I felt it. You know, I'll let things just go. Like, I just, I just let them go. So um, I, I now have a little bit more of a method, especially when I wrote my book. I just followed, I followed Nick, and I followed uh, advice I read by um, Stephen King. Yeah. That's who true. said, just sit down and write. Yeah, he's like, just write 2,000 words a day. In other words, for him, make the hours, start writing. If yeah. you write 2,000 words a day, that's amazing. You're going you're gonna to end up at the end of the summer, you'll have a book. So I would say, yeah, I would say you have to discipline yourself or the inspiration. Uh, it's just not going to see the end of the day. You have to, you have to work. Well, I, I think 2,000 words a day is a lot. Uh, it's a lot, yeah. he, He's one of those guys who can do it. But if you do 500 words a day, um, minimum, um, then it's still, you know, 160 working days, um, to, to finish a book, and, and that leaves you a lot of the year as well. That leaves you a lot of the year. So you're, what you're telling her is get off your ass, yeah. stay stay on one, stay on it, like stick with it. I guess well, she doesn't know which one to stick with because she's inspired by a new thing. The new idea is always better than the old idea because the old idea, you're halfway through it, and it's suddenly no longer this thing of that's what I'm going to do. It's like you're 40,000 words in, you're, you're halfway through it, uh, all sorts of problems have been thrown up that you haven't thought about. When it's not romantic anymore. Yeah. The truth is that finishing something is always a grind um, and, right. and, and doing something for the 10th time or, you, you know, re relaying the drum track or whatever it is that you guys have to do. Yeah. Um, where, it, it, yeah, the spark of the original creativity is gone, really. Yeah. And, and you're down to the work of it. But it's it's that detail that pays off. I think movies have helped me a lot to see that, that, mm. um, that there's no way of getting by when you're making a movie or a TV show uh, because they they have to do things ten times. Um, you, you have to do the reverse angle. You have to uh, cut it from above. You, uh, right. So you have to do it five times anyway. And when I tell you, when you're a writer and you're hearing your words for the fifth time, <laughs> you think, Jesus Christ, what was I thinking of? <laughs> and that makes you work harder. Yeah, because it's mocking you repeatedly, yeah, like repeatedly. in front of your face. Yeah. I felt I felt like that when I was uh reading my um because I've only written one book, but I was reading my um uh audiobook. Yeah. You know, and I'm like, nye, 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 nye. like, like, are you serious? You wrote it that way, and I changed a lot of things to the way that I would actually say it. So I can't fucking read this. This is terrible. Did you go on a reading tour? No, you couldn't. I, I did a little bit because I was on tour, and so I was reading, and I found that I just kept reading the same four or five chapters until I, I remember those now. But the rest of them, I, I, I've weren't because it, I, I always find that that there are three or four bits that work. Um, yeah. to be read out loud and you don't have to explain too much context and um you know it's usually from the first half of the book and so you know if you do a reading tour here and in the US maybe in Germany as well that you've read those pieces 50 times and uh by the yeah. end of it you're pretty convinced that you're the worst writer who's ever been sent out on a reading tour yeah that it's that's that's pretty rough. I feel the same about playing music sometimes. It's like uh, the, 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 the album that you've just done, while everyone's like, the last thing I did was the greatest thing in, in press. In reality, for me, it's, 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 it quickly becomes the worst one. It makes it tough. You got to go out and sell, sell, sell something that you're oh, like, yeah. ugh, yeah. I don't know. I, I, sorry, next. I guess I'll do another one so to cover that, to cover my tracks <laughs> of, of the other. And it's a complicated business because your relationship with your old work, of course you're proud of it, but you want to feel that this one is better than the thing you did before. Absolutely. So you don't want people to keep banging on about the first book or the first album. Yeah, yeah, the the, the ego has to kick in uh, yeah. on those things. You identify. I don't even feel like I wrote the, uh, uh, any, anything. If it's a year, over a year ago, I feel like it's just something someone else wrote. I, yeah, I don't I, I don't. I feel Every now and again, I've not read any of my books. 
um, apart from at the proof stage where I have to make corrections. Yeah. But every now and again, I have to check something and I read it and I thought, wow, this isn't bad. I couldn't write like that anymore. Yeah. You, and, and probably that's true. Like that. You might be able to write better than that. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. you do have to, and that's something I always push on this podcast a lot, is one of the hardest things about continuing a career or continuing to write anything is that you're going to wake up a different person, and, you, and you're getting patted on the back for the person you were last yeah. week. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. finding that new voice is not really much easier than finding your original voice when you're uh, a new writer. It's just as difficult and probably uh, definitely upsets more people. Well, it's, it's um, I guess, the equivalent to your voice breaking when you're a teenager. Mm. Um, that it, you know, you think, am I going to be able to sing anymore? I, I had this great treble, and now I've yeah. got this thing, and uh, it, the, the, there's a chance that you won't be the same writer you were when you were 30 as you are when you're 50 because yeah. of what's happened to you in between. Let's hear the second question, since we failed to answer that that woman's uh, question at all, and hopefully illuminated the difficulties. No, we, we told her to stick at it. Stick at it. That's what we told her to do. Yeah, and 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 and, to, and yeah, to actually put in the the, the work. The, yeah. What you can't tell her is why. Why take this? <laughs> why take that inspiration and not that inspiration? Yeah. 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 And for you, the movies have often done that. If someone gives you an assignment, that part's done. You yeah, know what exactly. you're. Yeah. yeah, and she doesn't have that luxury, and neither does a songwriter at the beginning or a novelist. So good luck. Next. <laughs> Next question. Hi, Ben. I've recently been working on writing a book just kind of for fun, and I was wondering if you think there is any similarities between songwriting and creative writing. Thank you. Yeah, well, I mean, the first thing that stuck out to me is you're writing a book for fun. And um, I don't know, I hate to be an old grump, but I've never really had that much fun um, writing. There are moments that are enjoyable, but goddamn, it's every time I've written something, I, I, I've, I've, I haven't been able to find the fun in it. So that, that's, that sticks out that maybe you'll want to amend the fun part of it as you get into it and, 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 get, and get stuck in the weeds. Uh, but the other part, yes, here's the main similarity I found, is that I thought when I wrote a book that I suddenly had all of the real estate in the world in which to work. I thought that, oh, okay, look, I have to keep my shit to three verses and three choruses and maybe a bridge. That's not a lot of real estate. And I've always had to be a uh, uh, brief about and, and poetic. I have to I have to write zip files that people can unzip poetically and understand. I thought when I wrote a book, I've got all the space in the world. And what I found out was that you have to be brevity is just as important in writing a book. That was the that was my similarity. Otherwise, I was a lot less comfortable writing a book. So I made. Uh, I, I I made writing hours and I took it very seriously and, I, and as a result I actually made my deadline. Deadline. What do you think? You've written both, Nick. Well, I I can't write music. That looks like the most fun to me. Um, yeah, it's easier. But, <laughs> um, I was surprised when we did our thing um, that it just seemed to be the same parts of the brain. Actually, yeah. Uh, I mean the same thing. You say. You thought you had all the real estate in the world. I, I, you know, I got the idea that there wasn't much real estate, but um, in the end, I'm trying to write a story in in the form that I've been given. And, yeah. Um, and I, you know, I've done that a lot in my career. Whether it's these ten minute episodes like for State of the Union, which are a bit like songwriting, or a, or a book or a screenplay, I think you always run out of space. Um, when screenplays are scary, it's like 120 pages with not much writing on each page. And you can get to the end real quick and think, shit, I've not said anything that uh, this film is supposed to be about. It, that feels much more like painting a room, you know. Mm. The, the first draft is to get rid of the colour that was under there and then you've got to do loads of other drafts. On oh, top of I that. like that image. Um, but... Uh, I. I I wouldn't say that I've I've felt any kind of violent difference between 
screenwriting, novel writing, songwriting, any of it. It's it's writing. It's um, trying to use the form as uh, with as much ingenuity as as you can. And yes, um, trying to push it against the limitations that you've got, but recognizing that they're there. Yeah, and it is interesting that that whatever you've decided the size, since we're on a room analogy, whatever the size of your room, you tend we tend to fill it up with furniture. You know, like like whatever it is, it gets there. If you're someone who's the kind of person that's going to cram, no matter what size room, you're going to cram it full of crap. Yeah. Or if yeah. you're very Spartan about it, and you're the kind of person that's only going to put three pieces in, long form or short form, it seems like the same room to me. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I dig that. So, good luck with the uh, with with the uh, with with the book. I hope the fun part sticks for you for for uh, for for longer. Um, but if it doesn't, then stick with it and remember it was fun at one point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I haven't had much fun either. So, yeah, it is. I've worked with songwriters and worked with musicians who. I envy them because they do seem to be having more fun than I feel like I'm having. Like the the high five and around the room over the thing they just did. And and I'm kind of like, really? Does that? And I was, I did a thing with with two other Bens, Ben Lee and Ben Queller. And and I really felt like I was the stick in the mud. Those guys were having a a fucking blast. And I really felt like, and they'd have to go find me somewhere because I I decided I wanted to go to the dark room. And I basically, because I was so, felt so much pressure about, the perfection yeah, yeah. of yeah, the next yeah. point that I just, I froze and I would have to leave and take time. And uh, that's, again, that's the perfectionist thing. There's an absolutely wonderful song by Commander Cody. Um, oh, I remember Commander Cody. That's uh, old. It's called Too Much Fun. And um, and and the story in the, in, the, in the song is that this kid from the sticks goes on to have fun in the, in the big town. And at the moment he gets there, he's arrested for having too much fun. And the chorus, the chorus is too much fun. That's news to me. Too much fun. There must be a whole lot of things that I ain't never done. But I ain't never had too much fun. And uh, that, that is my writing life. I think that's no one's so good. No me in jail for having too much fun. <laughs> I love that. Can I get you to give us a uh, an exercise, a professor? Hornby exercise uh, that would be a creative exercise that's achievable in a week. I call them new new week's resolution. What you think someone can do uh, daily just for for a week while while they're under your spell? This might seem like an anti creative exercise, but I have to say it, it really helped me and changed my life. Which is uh, to get a thousand piece jigsaw and set it up in your writing room. Amazing. Okay, um, I find that. Um, The big problem for me with writing is not writing the sentences, but what you do in between the sentences, because the sentences don't come for me in some long and gushing flow. Hmm. Um, I I have to write a little bit, and then I have to stop, and I don't know what's coming next. Now, what you do with that time in between sentences um, can make or break your day. And, um, And I do too much looking at, YouTube and watching old Arsenal goals and yeah. um, and Shit, reading yeah. the news obsessively and mm-hmm. blah 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 blah. And I've got this big table behind me. Oh, um, I see them. Uh, and I I now have usually a thousand piece jigsaw on the go. And the moment I'm stuck here, I can turn around and I I can do the jigsaw. And I found that it doesn't stop me thinking. That's um, great about what I'm supposed to be doing. And you, you can't get stuck with a jigsaw. Um, you know, oh. it's like you, you could just keep going. There's and fate in the jigsaw too because you know it's all meant to be. Like it, the answer exactly. is actually there. I love that. Exactly, the answer is there. So I, those of you who are trying to do something creative at home, I think if you have – get yourself a, not less than 500. Uh, okay. Um, uh, that one thousand piece jigsaw that you're into. I, I have to say, the best one I did was the cover of Sergeant Pepper's, which is, I think, the hardest thing I've ever done. God, it would. Writing. It would be once you got the corners together, it get tough. 
Well, the faces at the top are great, but the roses that spell out the beetle. <laughs> of course, yeah. There wasn't a single piece that, that looked like a letter. It, uh, it, was, it was incredible. Amazing. Well, there you have it. Make uh, you know, I think that's a great exercise. That actually may be more than a week. That might be a new habit for you. I really like that. Week, I would like it to be a habit for you. Great. Yeah. Well, Nick, so good to talk to you. I have like 80 more questions I wrote down, and we'll just do 80 more podcasts, and we'll be fine. I would love to. And really good to see you, and, and we'll catch nice up sometime when it's not in front of everybody. Yeah, have a good weekend. All right. Cheers, man. Uh, bye, Ben. If you're enjoying listening to Lightning Bugs, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. It helps a lot. Thank you oh so much for watching Lightning Bugs on YouTube. Check out more episodes and subscribe if you have not already. You can also listen to Lightning Bugs wherever podcasts may be found.